very much. I thought it was somebody before me. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak on this and I welcome the fact that I have time to do it. It's the first time really in the um, context of this bill that there's time because this bill was published on Monday and we're now discussing it today. Um, the note from the library which we got today points out that they didn't have enough time. So now we're looking at that. And let's place this time in perspective. The 2015 bill was a seismic change in theory. And we're told with the note, um, the, the marriage, so we're talking about two bills, two acts here from the 19th century. The Marriage of Lunatics Act, 1811, we're told by the minister. And the note we got was repealed in February 21. I think, uh, that's 210 years. Okay, so it's taken 210 years to repeal that piece of legislation. And then the next piece of legislation is the 1871 Act, which was um, done away with by the 2015 Act after 144 years, but not really because that act was never brought into operation. So now we're looking at 151 years later where now say we're repealing that act. So just put this in context and then we get a bill published on Monday and we're supposed to work through that bill. Now with the best will in the world and even with my background which is becoming increasingly more distant to me um, uh, because I packed it in in 16 and even then I was no expert on statutory interpretation. My area of expertise was in a different area. But we're now being presented with almost 70 pages of an amending bill, three parts in 87 sections, to amend an act that was never into operation. And we're talking about vulnerable people who maybe lack capacity. But the real question, that's, the question that's begged is, where is the lack of capacity really? Where is the lack of capacity, Minister? And again, I've often said to you that you've inherited the situation, but, and, I, and I pay respect to your bona fides. But here we are now, rushing through something after 211 years, I think, 210 and 151, and suddenly we have to pass this bill very quickly without really any discussion. Um, that's an impossibility. I can't do my job as a parliamentarian. I simply can't do it with the best will in the world. And even with my own background, I still don't understand quite a lot of this because you need the act before you that we never enacted or implemented and the bill and going around. So let's see then the system that has been set up to do this is the cross-party committee. And they produced a report, and I took the trouble of reading that. And they, like the library service, say, we didn't have enough time. So we make these recommendations with a caveat. We did not have enough time. And in fact, our consultation process happened over Christmas, and those with whom we should be consulting in a meaningful way didn't really happen. So they then they make 64 recommendations, and they identify eight issues. And, and I read that. I want to pay tribute to them actually on that committee. Um, so then I, I'm, I'm looking to see, are these being implemented? Yeah, this, the recommendations and the eight issues, have they been taken on board? And so then I go then to the library uh, uh, and their bill digest and I look to see which of them have been implemented. And in short, they're telling me, and again, I'm paying tribute to the library service, of the 64 recommendations, the Digest tells us that 34 of them have not been accepted or implemented in the bill. So at this point, 34 of the 64 recommendations haven't been accepted or implemented. 18 of them, the impact of key issue is not clear within the bill or insufficient information available to the bill's digest to assess. So therefore they can't help us in relation to that matter. Seven of their recommendations, the bill may be described as adopting an approach consistent with the key issue. And then in relation to four, key issue has clearly been accepted. So out of 64, the bill's digest tells us that four have been clearly accepted. Over half of the cross-parties committee recommendations have been ignored 
and only four have been incorporated into the bill. No, I don't wish to be negative. I really realise the seismic change that the 2015 Act was and that this amending legislation is supposed to be theoretically, and I pay tribute to the officials, this is a complex matter. I have no hesitation in saying that. Where my difficulty arises is the ramming through of it at this point, after 200 years and after 170 years, without proper consultation. I'm not saying that. The committee that did the pre-legislative scrutiny, not, not on the bill, but on the heads of the bill, is telling us they didn't have enough time and they have serious concerns. So then I, I say, what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with words of court. It's unclear how many words of court are. So let me see what the um, Anya Flynn, the director of the DSS, said in December 21. She said, almost 2,000 persons have been declared wards of court since the 2015 Act was enacted. So we had the 2015 Act, seismic change, clearly recognition that the wards of court under terrible 19th century um, lunacy legislation was totally inappropriate and was not allowing this country to comply with our legal obligations under any of the international instruments. And we bring in the Act, but we don't implement it. And between that time and the time of the heads of the bill, we don't interact with any disability group on the ground either to find out what were the inadequacies of the 2015 bill or why it wasn't being enacted. I repeatedly asked questions through my colleagues that work with me in my office. When was this going to be enacted? And when the DSS was set up and so on. And we kept up the pressure as best we could. And so now we come to this, and I thank you for the briefing yesterday, which was, was somewhat helpful. And we ask, because you gave us a briefing note as well, to say the urgency here was a constitutional challenge. And so I asked the nature of the challenge, not the details, I realised the sensitivity of it. However, I did ask, when, when, were, when was, where did the urgency come from? Was, was it due to be heard? Was the case due to be heard? When were the proceedings enacted? And um, you gave me a note. And it seems that they were, was it 2017, uh, they were enacted. Uh, I've just lost my little note. Do you have it there, Thomas? I just might borrow yours for a second. Garmin Magad Yep. Um, in December 19, a constitutional challenge was taken by an individual against the government in relation to both the Marriage of Lunatics Act 1811 and the Lunacy Regulation Act 1871, which underpins wardship in the state. So I take from that that the proceedings were initiated in 2009 against the 19th century legislation that's completely unacceptable on every level. So I get an inkling of where the impetus to change came from. Again, not a proactive Department of Justice at the time or a proactive, the new name of the department, but legal challenge, a legal challenge. And it looks like the government has conceded, I understand, in relation to this, correct me if I'm wrong, but they have conceded they will have no chance of defending this case, so they've conceded, and you've given a commitment to counsel for the plaintiff, correct me if I'm wrong, in relation to this legislation being enacted in, in now in June. What I don't understand is why June without proper consultation? Was the case due to be heard in June, is in July? Is there, why is there secrecy surrounding this? You know, I, I think at the very least we need openness and accountability. And then when we pushed in relation to that, interestingly in Deputy, in Minister Rabbit's speech today, there's no mention of that case being the, the um, impetus for the change of legislation, which is interesting. And then parallel with that, you tell us, well, a lot of the organisations have put in huge work, which I appreciate, the health executive, um, the banks, and the various organisations that will be impacted by it, that they've put in huge work in relation to this. They were led to believe June, so therefore, magically, it has to be June. So to me, I don't diminish the work that has, has been done. But what really concerns me is the same effort and same recognition hasn't gone in to people on the ground who know best in relation to this area, because I am no expert on this. But I'm able to identify problems and concerns, and I surely have a lot of them. So I have no idea why extra emphasis would be put on the amount of 
um, preparation that the banks have got put in, or the credit unions, or housing officials, as opposed to the people on the ground. So please, Minister, if you could tell us what is the urgency for June, not after we've waited a combination, if you put the two together, we've waited 347 years, but I'm being a bit disingenuous there. But we've waited for 1811 to 2021 and from 1871 onwards. So how do we get this right? What has happened? And of course, in the meantime, I'm told that other countries have moved on. And this is courtesy of the um, NUIG Galway. And they tell us that the Centre for Disability Law and Policy. Now, I, I tend to listen to an organisation like that, as well as the other organisations that represent people with the, the spectrum of disabilities. Um, and they, they have serious concerns in relation to this. And they also raise the constitutional challenge and the significance of that uh, being tied in with an arbitrary date in June. They tell us that the bill does not address... Now, I tried myself, but I, 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 I'd, be telling, I'd be misleading you to say that I discovered these concerns. I just didn't have the time. It took me ages to read all of this. And I went back and actually read, in 2017, a document produced by the Library, which pointed out the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act. How will it work? Well, that's a very good question. How will it work? Well, it will never work because we're never going to enact it because this was May 17. And this was two years after the bill was enacted. And they tell us that it was a seismic, a seismic change. It was upper, a paradigm shift, a cultural shift, and so on. You identify it all. Never enacted. So the question has to be asked, in God's name, why was it enacted? Why, what happened from... 2015 up to 2022 when we're now faced with an arbitrary June decision and we have somebody like the Irish Centre for Disability laying out. So I, I've numbered them and there seems to be at least 11 or 12 genuinely serious concerns. The bill does not address some major flaws in the original assisted decision-making capacity bill even though we're being told that this is the opportunity. It was understood that this was to be addressed. So they point out if someone makes an advanced healthcare directive uh, under the 2015 Act stating that they do not want medical treatment, that will not be binding uh, for the person detained under the Mental Act. And I think in fairness to you, Minister, you said yesterday you accept that, but this shouldn't be in this, uh, in this bill. It has to be under the reforming mental health, health legislation. I, I'm not sure, but I accept what you're saying to me in relation to that, but it's a glaring gap. Then there's a glaring gap that the uh, bill does not extend the advantages to people aged 16 and 17. The glaring gap that it does not remove the deleterious effect on the unborn language despite the repeal of the eighth. But I do know that you're now going to have an amendment uh, yourself and I welcome that. But again, it begs the question, why wasn't that all in the bill given? given? We're talking about 2015 and talking about 2022. Um, the functional test of mental capacity, which has been deemed a human rights violation by the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability, still remains in the bill. Um, they tell us that the Act as it stands is not compliant with Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability because it allows an individual's legal capacity to be based on an assessment of their mental capacity and so on. And it still, meant, it still has the substituted decision-making uh, process, which is, I understand, against the UN uh, and certainly what has been set out in, I think it was their explanatory memorandum or their um, direction. It makes it difficult for people to access and use supports they would like. For example, you now have, a, a, I welcome the two tier in relation to the enduring powers of attorney. What I don't welcome is that now there's two, a parallel process where if you make, you have to make an advanced 
health care directive entirely separate from the enduring po powers of attorney. So you've made it more difficult and more bureaucratic. Uh, uh, and, and they're asking for that to be deleted, and I fully support that. They have problems with the additional offences. They say they're not necessary. And again, Minister, when we talked about this yesterday, you talked about the silence in relation to the restraint was a positive thing, or at least your advisors did. Uh, the Centre for Disability and Law don't think it's such a positive thing, and they're ac asking for uh, uh, a to be specifically stated that restraint is not acceptable. There's difficulties in relation to jury, although you're telling us that it's an improvement. I haven't had enough chance to check it, and I'm simply now parroting at this point the concerns of the uh, NUIG um, Centre for Disability Law and Policy. I, I myself, from what I've read, have the greatest difficulty with assessments being carried out by, um, although I welcome the three-tier, I welcome the fact, that, and I welcome the tenor of the bill in terms of enabling and empowering. So we'll have help somebody to assist them make a decision, then there's the co-decision, and the top one is where the decision is made for them. And I would think that would, should be rare uh, if we're going to go with the spirit of the, of the, of the bill. Uh, I'm not sure about legal aid. It's not clear to me how, how, how will that be available. Um, now, it's entirely unclear to me how you're going to deal with the number of people who have been declared wards of court. And just to show the total confusion that has been created by the... April the 1st, again, we might get, uh, I've said this on other occasions, we might get a clue from the date, the 1st of April. But in preparation, notice in relation to applications for wardship, this was to the barristers and solicitors, in preparation for the commencement of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act 15, the President of the High Court has directed that the Office of Wards of Court will stop accepting wardship applications. So there was a direction from the 22nd of April, no more wardship applications. Fast forward then to the 12th of May, the exact same language, except the Office of Wards of Court will recommence taking applications. Imagine that for confusion, utter confusion. One Direction say no more wards of court on the 1st of April, back up to the 12th of May, we're taking wards of court. So. You, you, you try to be positive and you try to say, we want to work with you. And then we see all of this without any adequate explanation. We see what is the total number of wards of court. It seems that 2,000 or 2,200 have been created unnecessarily since 2015 when the Act was supposedly, in theory, to stop the wards of court. And we seem to have got 2,000, 2,200 since then. Is that in addition to the, I think Deputy Callaghan was trying to clarify this as well. So is it 3,000 wards of court, 4,000? And how are the courts going to manage that? You mentioned something yesterday in passing that there would be a panel of judges. So, and there's a three year period. How are they going to manage that? What resources are going to be put into place? How is that, who is going to pay for that when you want medical evidence before the courts? Is more and more going to come out of the, of the estates of those who have been declared wards of court? And while we're talking on that, I understand that there are funds in court of 1.46 billion. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but this should all be set out for us. What is the total amount of funds now that are there under the wardship uh, system presided over by the President of the High Court? What's going to happen to those funds? We know now that the director of the, uh, the SSS, or what's the name of it again? The, thank you. She, that person who happens to be a female is not going to uh, deal with that. That property has been taken from her. Where is the information of what's going to happen in relation to those funds? Please, nobody has said. This is crucial, given what Deputy Richard Barrett has already alluded to, and which I've raised in the past, the serious concerns. Now, I sat on the Public Accounts Committee where a report came before us and told us that the investments were done, and not, not wisely, but there was no question. But the, 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 the group have highlighted that no assessment independently was done 
of the decision making and the risk taking around the investment of funds. So there are questions there in relation to that. We'll ignore that at our peril, but that's what we're doing. And we have no clarification. And I mean, can you tell us today, what, Minister, what is the total funds being held by the High Court? Where are they going to? Who's going to manage them? Are we going to outsource with each one as, uh, as the ward of court is transferred over to the new system? What is going to happen in relation to all of that? I'm going to conclude by saying I really want to work with you, but it's impossible without proper explanations, without getting rid of the arbitrary date in June, given that we've waited 200 years and 170 years, and particularly that other countries have done it better. And we should have learned in the meantime that empowering and enabling is exactly what they mean. And that's what we should be doing. And the best people to educate us on that are the people who have a disability or their organisations. And we have utterly ignored them. And I'll finish by saying the Act obliges the human rights, Irish Human Rights and Equality to consult with the um, disability organisation, but not with other organisations. That's also unacceptable.